All right, we have a great set of speakers lined up for you today. Joe Grunfest is the W.A. Frankie Professor of Law and Business Emeritus at Stanford Law School and Senior Faculty of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Before joining the Stanford Law School faculty in 1990, Joe was a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission and served on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors as Council and Senior Economist for Legal and Regulatory Matters. Colleen Honigsberg is a professor of law at Stanford Law School, where her research is focused on the empirical study of corporate and securities law. She's also a member of the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee, where she advises the Commission on Regulatory Priorities and various initiatives to help protect investors and promote the integrity of the U.S. securities markets. Colleen has a PhD in accounting, and before joining the law school faculty, she worked as a CPA and served as a senior economic research fellow with the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Today's session will be moderated by Bobby Bartlett, the I. Michael Heyman Professor of Law at Berkeley Law School. Bobby is a co uh, excuse me, as a founder and program co-director of Startup at Berkeley Law, UC Berkeley's primary platform for training entrepreneurs and investors on legal, financial, and operational issues confronting venture-backed startup companies. And I am very pleased to announce that starting in July, Bobby will be joining the faculty at Stanford Law School, and Bobby and Colleen will become the new faculty co-directors of the Rock Center. All right, welcome everyone. I'm going to turn things over to Bobby, and I will go ahead and get our slides going. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Kristen, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us today uh, in this uh, discussion of uh, the litigation fallout uh, regarding the um, uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. And we're going to focus today's session on a narrow set of issues, which is primarily related to uh, what type of litigation uh, we might expect uh, from the failure of, of the bank. Um, and then also some related accounting issues that um, have surfaced regarding uh, why it is the case that this caught so many people uh, flat-footed. Um, so uh, we'll focus primarily on those two two items. Um, before we get started, though, um, and Kristen, if you can move to the next slide, um, there is a bit of a, a cautionary uh, uh, note we have to make, which is uh, we don't mean to endorse uh, any of the litigation theories that we're presenting today, um, uh, and we also don't mean to necessarily discount them either. We're trying to just simply uh, provide a lay of the land of the types of claims that uh, we're likely to see over the uh, coming weeks um, and months. Um, so um, we also um, don't profess to have a, a comprehensive uh, summary of all of the, the claims um, that can arise as well. Um, there's likely to be um, any, any number of, of uh, claims that could arise that might be outside the scope of what we're going to focus on today, which is pri primarily related to claims relating to uh, disclosure items, um, and claims relating to um, uh, board oversight uh, obligations and uh, bank regulatory obligations with respect to managing uh, the risk um, within Silicon Valley Bank. So uh, without uh, further ado, I will um, turn things over first to Joe, uh, or sorry, first to Colleen, who's going to give us a little bit of a, a background uh, in terms of uh, what, what led to the, the failure of SVB. So uh, Colleen, uh, would you like to take it from there? Right. Um, so Kristen, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I think, as Bobby had mentioned, you know, when we actually originally envisioned this seminar, I think we had, it was about a week ago, and I think we had 12 slides. We are now up to 33, and there's simply no way we're going to be able to cover it all. Um, but if there's something that we're not able to cover today, just, of course, we're available to chat offline. And so please do reach out to any of us. Um, so now on the next slide, before we get into some of these specific claims that we want to discuss, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to the timeline. So here we have Silicon Valley Bank's um, you know, stock returns over our main period. And there are a couple of key events that we really want to highlight before we even move on. So first, on February 26th, we had Silicon Valley Bank's CEO file a uh, 10B1-10B5-1 trading plan with the SEC to potentially sell shares. Second, on February 24th, uh, Silicon Valley Bank filed its 10K for 2022. So particularly when we discuss some of the issues with respect to the auditor, you know, we'll keep in mind that the financial statements are going to cover up through December 31st. And then in terms of subsequent events, the auditor would only have been aware of what had happened up through that February 24th date. Um, third, on February 27th, we have SBB CEO sell shares for a total of 3.6 million. 
um, 4th on March 1st. Moody's um, reportedly, you know, called SVB, indicated that they were going to downgrade their bank um, credit rating. And then on 3-9, on March 9th, this is where we really see the collapse. And so, you know, mass exodus of depositors and then a significant decline in our stock price. So uh, Kristen, next slide. Now, while the prior slide was really just highlighting SVB's um, stock price, we also want to make sure that you guys are aware of stock returns in the bank sector more generally. So this is going to be the bank returns from March 10th, the day that uh, the FDIC took over SVB through yesterday. And what we really want to highlight here is the dichotomy between these sort of two big to fail banks, our JP Morgans, our B of A's, you know, our city groups, um, compared to these kind of smaller regional banks. And what we see is that, you know, the two big to fail banks have been relatively steady. By contrast, if we look at the returns for these, you know, smaller regional banks, we see a lot more volatility um, and then declining stock prices. So when we think about litigation, it's not just about SVB, but we want to consider and keep in mind these regional banks as well. Um, also, for thinking about regulatory and policy implications, we really want to think about what is the role and the proper regulation for these smaller regional banks. And so with that, I think I'll hand it over to Joe. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when you talk about the possibility of litigation, if we could have the next slide, the first thing you want to do is you want to get a vision of who's going to be sitting at the table, and what are their incentives. This table is going to be very crowded, and the incentives are going to run in many different directions, and they will often intriguingly be at cross purposes. So as a practical matter, we know that the Department of Justice, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, the DC Federal Reserve, the FDIC and state regulatory agencies, they have already announced that they're gonna be investigating this. Congressional hearings, there will be many of them. The first is already scheduled for March 29th. At least two class action securities fraud claims are already on file. We can expect that the plaintiffs are gonna be filing 220 demands that have either already landed and are not yet public, or will soon be landing. Now, who are the defendants? Very interesting and fascinating story. Clearly, you've got the bank holding company, but, 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 but. The publicly traded entity, which was the bank holding company that had the bank that is now in receivership, is bankrupt. Silicon Valley Bank Financial was the holding company. It had other assets in addition to the bank. It is now in Chapter 11. What does that mean? That means that even if plaintiffs are able to win in a securities fraud class action, private party plaintiffs, and even if they're able to win in derivative claims, at the end of the maze that leads to the cheese, you're going to discover that the cheese here is a claim in bankruptcy. It's not going to be 100 cents on the dollar. So if you wind up going against the entity, you're going to get wampum, okay? It's, it's not going to be the traditional payout. Well, then you're left looking at who are going to be the other deep pockets sitting at the table. Well, we've got the officers and directors, the auditors, KPMG, and we'll see KPMG has audited many of the banks that are potentially defendants in these types of actions. Goldman Sachs, who was the advisor on the large capital raise that was arguably the proximate cause of the actual bank run. And then of course, we've got the DNO policy itself. Now it's not public information as to how large that DNO policy is. I don't know, but I called around among my friends and I said, hey, what do you think if you had to guess? And the number that comes up most often, and let me emphasize, this is a pure guess, is about a hundred million dollars. Is it possible that the lawyers defending the board and the officers and everyone else will be able to eat the $100 million? Of course you guys can. I have confidence in you. There's no doubt that lawyers and defense fees uh, will be able to consume a large part of the DNO policy. So we then have a very, very interesting situation. If you look at it from the perspective of private party litigants, you may wind up chasing the truck, but what do you get? 
all right, in this situation? And from whom will you be able to get it? By the way, one of the plaintiff's class action securities fraud suits that's already on file was originally filed naming the SVB financial, the bankrupt entity. It's been amended to voluntarily dismiss that entity in order to avoid the bankruptcy stay. So these complexities are already becoming aware to the plaintiffs and how different plaintiffs' firms wind up negotiating, this will be fascinating to observe. Next slide. Joe, just a quick uh, a footnote question on, on that. Um, you know, the, the there's also, um, in the bankruptcy, which of course being orchestrated by the unsecured creditors. So I, I understand there's, there's existing about $3 billion of face amount of unsecured debt. And evidently there's about $2 billion of cash that uh, SVB Financial um, has, but it's being held in, uh, not surprisingly, uninsured uh, depository accounts at um, at what is now Silicon Valley Bridge Bank. Um, any thoughts on how and if um, the, uh, the the FDIC and the Fed are going to allow that full $2 billion to be fully paid out? I expect that there's going to be litigation about that. I expect that the FDIC, for a variety of reasons, is going to argue this money, she is ours. All right. We've had to incur lots of uh, expenses in order to insure people with deposits in excess of 250000 uh, And I expect that the government is going to make the strong claim in order to be able to protect the taxpayer uh, that there's nothing there for anybody else. Uh, do you have any views on that, Bobby? I don't. It's I find it kind of a puzzle because, you know, the formal position is uninsured deposits will will be fully backstopped. But um, but it does seem as if these are tainted. Uh, these are tainted uh, deposits. Um for what it's worth, uh, the bonds are trading today at about 60 cents on the dollar. So I think there's some expectation that there's going to be um, a, a full or at least partial recovery on, on the unsecured uh, notes, which um, I, I, like you, I, I, I would find surprising given the, the, the politics of the, of the failure. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think there's going to be extraordinary and perfectly understandable political pressure for the FDIC to recover as much from the holding company as possible. Uh, in this area, and and you know, new law may have to be made in order to resolve those claims. So you know that that is an additional dimension to the complexity of litigation that's going to arise here. Which you know, from a professor's perspective, pedagogically, it's a gift from the gods. This is great. So the holding company is bankrupt, uh, and for many of the reasons we've already discussed, and you know, that are described in these bullet points. Um, what that does is it increases the focus and the attention on all of the other collateral parties. The D's and O's are now more in the crosshairs. The auditors are more in the crosshairs. Goldman Sachs is more in the crosshairs. Why? Because those are the places where the plaintiffs are going to say, hey, we can actually wind up uh, getting more value. Uh, next slide, please. And if you step back and if you start thinking about the different types of claims, they really, you know, at present at least, this may evolve over time, in my mind, fall in three general categories. You've got price inflation claims, you've got collapse causation claims, and you've got the FDIC in a special place. Price inflation claims. These are sort of classic claims that basically say, look, the stock was trading at $400 a share, it was really worth $1.95. And it's because of material omissions and misrepresentations that you inflated the stock, all right? And all purchasers wound up paying more than they should have, and that'll be the class with claims. Now, the interesting thing about pure price inflation claims in this context is they can proceed without making the argument that the price inflation actually caused the collapse of the bank that these material omissions and misrepresentations cause the collapse. There's a second class of claims which takes that second step. And it says, hey, wait a minute. What we have here is not just mismanagement, but legally actionable mismanagement. And we'll get to that in more detail when we discuss the potential FDIC claims under FURIA. Legally actionable mismanagement that crosses the business judgment line and or defective disclosures, material misrepresentations and omissions that actually wind up causing the bank's demise. Now, for a variety of reasons, I think there are going to be really interesting defenses, and it's going to be an interesting battle, uh, and we'll get to those in just a moment. In addition, the FDIC is going to have claims under FURIA, 
and they're going to be able to argue that there was grossly negligent management, and these claims are going to be uniquely prosecutable by the FDIC, and many of the facts that have come out are going to raise novel and interesting and highly litigable issues under Delaware law and the application of the Caremark Doctrine. When you talk about core risks that corporations face, and what is the board's responsibility to set up appropriate metering and measurement principles, and also to respond to red flags, how does that operate under Delaware law, which feeds into the FERIA standard, because here federal law also looks to state law, and as those of you who follow Delaware law know, the scope of care mark liability is expanding. It's expanding in directions that are hard to predict. And this litigation may give rise to additional substantial learning in that space. Bobby, Colleen, any suggestions, observations? Well, I had, you know, sort of a thought, Joe, I'd be curious to hear your, your opinion, which is, you know, we've we've been here before, uh, not that long ago, uh, with uh, Washington Mutual, um, with with City, um, both of which involved um, failures of, one might say, failures of oversight with respect to risk risk management. Um, and um, I guess the, the, the question is, is uh, with respect to City, for instance, um, there is no oversight claim. Um, do you, Do you think that the Caremark doctrine has evolved in such a fashion that um, we could see more of a likelihood for Caremark liability in this in this context. Well, I think I think it's I think it's beyond doubt that the trajectory of Caremark doctrine since then has really moved in a direction that most practitioners would find surprising. It's expanded. You have a look at Vice Chancellor Laster's recent opinion with regard to McDonald's and sexual harassment. Uh, and liability of officers and fiduciary duties and red flags analysis. Um, you can easily see plaintiffs taking much of that language and extrapolating it to say, hey, wait a minute, when you have so many notices of, of you know, deficiencies by your examiners and requests for immediate action and you're not responding, that crosses the line to gross negligence and winds up being care mark violation. I think you have you probably have to expand the law from where it is today to get there, but the plaintiffs will definitely push on that. There's no doubt, and it'll be intriguing to see where Delaware courts go with that. Um, you know, to the extent that that issue winds up being litigated, it's going to make new law no matter how it gets decided. Yeah, and on that note, it's interesting in the McDonald's opinion, uh, Laster went out of his way to disting distinguish, I think it was a 2000 uh, uh, opinion, which um, which had re relatively similar facts in terms of uh, allegations of sexual harassment among senior management where they found no liability. Um, so it's sort of this idea that, you know, the, the court's capable of, of updating its understanding of uh, what constitutes a proper response to a red flag. This is the key thing I often try to teach students. Pay attention to the where the, to where the law is going, not where the law has been, because this is an evolving story, especially in the area of corporate governance, social responsibility, and the like. These are new fact patterns that are evolving that are really hitting the courts with challenges that they haven't really addressed this way in the past. Uh, and, and this is a predictable new challenge that's going to make new law, and let's see how that evolves. Next slide. So if you stop and if you take a step back and you say, okay, I'm a plaintiff's lawyer, what can I complain about? Notice this is slide one of five, okay? And I edited this down. We could take two hours and go through all of the stuff. Let me just hit some of the highlights, okay? So first cautionary language, there's more to come. This is all gonna be rapidly evolving. There's going to be massive discovery. One of the things that the investigators are going to do, especially on the government side, is you're going to build a detailed chronology. You're going to try to figure out who talked to whom, who knew what, when, what was said, what was not said. And you have to pay attention, especially on the government side, to the political pressures. There's going to be very significant pressure to bring heads on a platter and to have 
people and organizations responsible. Now, take a step back. There are two competing trajectories here that have very different implications from a litigation perspective. We've got one set of investigations that's looking at what did the government do? Where were the regulators? There's good reason to believe that the regulators had all of the authority they needed in order to prevent this train wreck from happening. And there's also reason to believe, based on the public press, that they knew that this train wreck was likely to happen. All right. They knew about the maturity. They knew about how much of this stuff, how many of the deposits were, were you know, hot money that could move because it was above 250000 They knew more than anybody else about risk controls and issues they had with risk controls, and they let it go on. Well, there's going to be investigation as to why, and the feds are investigating themselves, all right, in terms of why didn't we shut this down and stop this sooner? Well, here's the reality. The more it seems that the feds did not behave appropriately in this context, the better that winds up being a defense for people on the bank side in the private litigation. On the other side, you're going to have lots of pressure and lots of investigation looking at what did the officers and directors know? What did they do? Why did they not respond to all of these warnings from the Fed? Was it a legitimate difference of opinion or did it cross the line uh, and actually become gross negligence? So the lit litigation implications of these two stories are very different. And understanding that from a litigation perspective, they almost run at cross purposes because I can see how the stronger the story of regulatory failure becomes, the more that becomes a defense on a variety of levels in terms of private party litigation. Bobby, Colleen, do you see it the same way, differently? Any nuance or subtleties there? I thought you stated it very well. I'd agree with your, your take. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and, and to me, it's really going to be fascinating to see how the Fed investigates the Fed to figure out why did we let this fail? We could have stopped this. Okay. We didn't. What what what's what's the TikTok behind that? Let's go to the next slide. Hey Joe, I, I will just say that I, I may be I may be less inclined to see it as a good defense, just in part because of of where when I sort of you know look my thing finger and put it in the air and see where Caremark is is heading, it, it does seem like there's it's it's there's definitely a red flag there. And then I think the, the question then becomes whether or not the courts are willing to substantively second guess what was done at SUB in order to respond, particularly to its its um, uh, risk of uh, deposits fleeing. Um, so, yeah. we'll, we'll so, so Bob, I, I think you're exactly right. And this is an area where, where you know, the, the challenge is going to be that in every other red flag case that I'm aware of, what you've got is, is a board or a management that has the ultimate authority. Here, we're going to make new law because the board or the management was not the ultimate authority. The Federal Reserve could have overridden them at any time they wanted. So could you recharacterize these as differences of opinion? All right, our examiners think that we've got a maturity mismatch. No, 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 no. We're comfortable that interest rates are going to stay longer for a long time. And if you think we're engaged in unsafe banking practices, you can force us to change. You're not forcing us to change. So all we have here is a strong difference of opinion. And that's not a violation of the business judgment rule. How's that so, yeah, we, we, yes, I, I I hear the argument. I I I think it's um, uh, I think it will be an interesting question about what actually was said, what what was um, the response to the Fed with respect to decisions to sort of cut any sort of interest rate hedging, uh, to sort of not engage in um, investing in shorter dated uh, durations when it seems as if the motivations was largely to sort of try to squeeze out some additional. Um, uh, quarterly profits. Um, th th those all seem like problematic facts for uh, uh, for a care mark claim. But again, it's like you said, if it really is the case that the Fed was actively involved and this was a difference of opinion, um, I, I could see that. I could see this being uh, a, a tougher call. Yeah, no, Bobby, I agree with you. Th these are the two stories that are going to be told. We're going to have conflicting narratives, 
and we're describing the conflicting narratives, and it'll be fascinating to see how the judicial system resolves. All right, you know, it's 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 like Rashomon, but about money. All right, we're going to have two different stories here. Now, in terms of the facts that are already out there, all right, it appears that the Federal Reserve repeatedly warned the bank about risk control lapses. Uh, according to New York Times, it said it was doing a bad job of ensuring it had enough easy to tap cash on hands in the event of trouble. All right, I'm quoting here. This is not stuff that I'm, I'm concocting. That it was deficient for governance and controls. It was relying on bad models to test portfolio response. There was no chief risk officer for much of 2022, and that wasn't disclosed. They brought in BlackRock, and their consulting arm warned the bank that its risk controls were substantially below its peers. Uh, there's all, there are also reports that the bank lost a crucial day to raise money from investors because the board rejected executives' financial projections, and that led to a chaotic and doomed scramble for cash. All right. Lots of questions about whether these matters were timely and accurately disclosed, whether they were material in context, did they cause the bank's failure, or did they, even if they didn't cause the failure, did they inflate the stock price? Third slide of five. And then you've got additional defective disclosures. Basically, anybody who says anything good about the bank, all right, uh, during a period of, of you know, alleged maturity mismatches, inappropriate risk controls or what have you, that's going to wind up being fodder for a complaint. Um, an additional observation is that there were tremendous, there were a tremendous number of, let me call them, interlocking financial relationships, all right, at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, and, and the question is going to be asked, did these give rise to inappropriate banking practices? Because you had the bank have relationships with individual executives and individual venture capitalists acting in their individual capacities. And at the same time, having banking relationships with the companies where the executives were executives and the venture capital funds um, where the VCs operate as, as partners in those funds. And then you've got the funds investing in the same companies and potentially the bank giving, you know, lending venture debt to those organizations. So you've got multiple relationships here. You can raise all sorts of questions about quid pro quos and back scratching and the like, but it's going to take a lot more investigation and thought to see if these give rise to actionable claims. In addition, when you're going to be thinking about conflicts, people will naturally ask whether Becker's position on the San Francisco Fed board led to a situation where they were not being investigated as aggressively and the examiners didn't take as aggressive a position as they should have. So you've got a web of conflicts and disclosures. I don't know how that's going to play out, but are the plaintiffs and the government going to look there? You betcha. You can take that to the bank. Colleen, Bobby, any thoughts on our third of five slides? Mm -hmm. I think we've already seen Elizabeth Warren have a little bit to say about that last point. Yep, absolutely. Fourth slide, please. Um, in these situations, you, you commonly find employees coming forward saying, I warned them about the disaster and the like. We're likely to see that here. We don't have that. At least I'm not aware of anything about that expressly in the press. You can ex express that. Uh, and then we have all of these questions about red flags. Colleen, I wonder if you could expand on the argument that the auditors could and should have done more rather than simply give an anodyne clean audit opinion under these circumstances. What more could they have done? Yeah, so I think actually this is the most interesting question that I've seen really come up with respect to the auditors. And there are three common or arguably common methods that you would investigate as to whether maybe they they could have raised something. First um, would be the standard, should we expect to see in the audit uh, report some sort of going concern opinion? And say, well, look, we're gonna have this little paragraph in here that says the financial statements were prepared assuming a going concern. Um, for what it's worth, this is a high bar and it's really primarily a determination by management as to whether this is a going concern. Um, it's also arguably a self-fulfilling prophecy in that if you have an auditor that says, 
hey, we have a going concern, you know, with in at a bank. Well, you're basically causing a run. So this is a very high bar here. Um, second, or is often thought to be a very high bar, and it's not like the auditors do very specific procedures looking for a going concern. Um, this is, there are some PCOB standards with respect to it, but it's fairly limited. Um, and then under GAP, it's much more about what is management thing. Then the other question would be, well, should this be a critical audit matter? And now in the audit report, the auditor is going to note, here are some critical audit matters, which are things that you know we struggled with that we think you should be aware of. Um, I have not, I looked at some of the other banks. I haven't ever seen a critical audit matter that describes something about like the interest rate risk and what we really saw happen here. Um, and then finally, you also, they could raise something like this through an emphasis of matter, a um, little statement in the audit report. Again, these are relatively rare and it's commonly considered to be a fairly high bar to where you get there. But I think this is really some of the interesting questions that we're going to get and that we're going to see with respect to the auditor. So, Colleen, let's roll back to the critical audit matters. If you think about the standards that are supposed to define what is identified and discussed as a critical audit matter, would it be possible for plaintiffs credibly to argue that Honestly, Joe, I don't think we know. Um, when you look through the critical audit matter, the releases, and they don't have any examples. They have an example with respect to sort of a held to maturity security, but it's not this particular situation. And critical auto matters haven't been around that long. So we just don't have a lot of litigation that we can point to that we can learn from here. So, so would it be fair to say that stay tuned? We're going to have yeah. important, this, right? This is the important point. We're going also to make new law here in terms of how we think about critical audit matters. We've never challenged established doctrine with a fact pattern of this sort. And let me ask you to predict, always very dangerous. How do you think this is gonna wind up getting resolved and why? I, and then I'll give you my prediction after you go first. Why don't you go first? Oh, I, I think this is, thank you very much. <laughs> You're not taking any chances. Um, the trajectory, at the SEC, which is going to be very influential in this, is expand, expand, expand. If we want to disclose, of course, we want you to disclose. So my bet is they would expand the understanding of critical audit matters to enlarge the tent. We're going to want to get more disclosures of stuff like this in the future. That strikes me as plausible. I think. I will say it's not one that I've heard so far. So to date, like, you know, I actually haven't heard that much discussion about the critical audit matters. It's been more in the press than it has been from what I've seen in policy circles. The policy proposal that I've heard the most with respect to auditors has actually been more back on that auditor rotation that we saw, you know, in the wake of Sarbanes-Oxley. And that should we have mandatory audit rotation. Uh, right now, post SOX, um, they had proposed mandatory audit firm rotation, didn't actually occur, but we do have audit partner rotation. Uh, whether we go back to audit firm rotation, I, that's the question that I see coming up more frequently. Well, here, here's what we know. We know that the regulators are going to sit down and say, we have to take action in response to this crisis. All right. It, that, that, this, this is the, the political process. And they're going to come up with a list of different things that we can do in order to demonstrate that we were responsive and responsible and we did things because Silicon Valley Bank failed. That's the way it always works. On that list will be, gee, do we need to expand our understanding of critical audit matters to address questions of this sort so that in the future, auditors faced with a similar situation will know that they have to say something. My prediction, is that's going to be on the list. And compared to many other things, that might be low-hanging fruit. I think that's a solid prediction. I, I mean, the pushback against that is like, okay, if they put this as a cam, are they in effect causing a run on the bank? And I think that would be the argument against it. I, I, I agree. And that's, and that's always been the push and pull in part of, you know, prudential banking. Right when when you, when you ha find a problem, the regulators go to the bank quietly, not publicly, 
because they don't want to destroy public confidence in the bank. That problem has been with us for decades. It will never go away. Also, also if, if while we're on the subject of how accountants should evaluate questions like going concern, um, what's so interesting about this failure is when you compare it to like other big failures like Washington Mutual or Continental Illinois in the, in the 80s, those are all precipitated by very large problems in the loan book, uh, which then uh, led to basically the uninsured deposits and the wholesale funding to completely sort of uh, pull their funds. Um, here, there, there was, there's no evidence that I've seen at all that there were any problems in the loan book. Um, and of course, it was all the interest rate, um, uh, mis the interest rate risk that that they had in their their bond portfolio, which is both liquid and incredibly uh, safe. Um, so, as I see, sort of the the, the sort of approximate cause of this problem is really just this, uh, what was effectively just a classic bank run. Um, if if they, it, I think it's I think it's fair to say that if there hadn't been this this run. Um, that Silicon Valley Bank would be fine. Um, interest rates, they had modeled out interest rates. They were expected to, to see net interest increase 3% um, and a 200 basis point increase in rates. Um, banks by structure are hedged against interest rate risk to the extent that, you know, as long as the deposit beta doesn't creep up too high, meaning that as long as the depositors aren't sort of opting from the no interest deposits to higher interest deposits, banks make money when interest rates go up. So what's so fascinating here is that this is almost entirely a function of the deposit base fleeing the, the bank. And I, for the life of me, I can't figure out how accountants would even evaluate that risk. Um, I don't know. I, Colleen, do you have, is, is there any precedent for, for focusing on that particular type of risk? Um, I can't think of precedent for that specific type of risk offhand. I'd have to actually look into it. But, you know, in general, look, if we're evaluating, you have your standard audit procedures, and then it's not like we have specific, here are procedures you have to do in case there's a going concern. It's more like these are issues that are going to arise as we're doing the standard audit review. Let, and let's, let's drill down a little bit on what Bobby said, because Bobby, I think, is exactly right, that it's possible to model this run as being different from any other run that I know of, at least any other major run. Bobby, is the following true, that if the depositors just would have kept their money in the bank, the bank strategy would have worked and they would have made money? Absolutely, yeah. Conditional on keeping the money in the bank, then they uh -huh. would have rolled over the low interest bonds. They would have been, they would have made money, yeah. Uh -huh. So this is, and this is really important. If you look at the financial crisis of 08 and 09, there were bad loans there. Why did things collapse that way? Well, we made a bunch of home loans and they were low quality loans and we were carrying them at 100 cents of the dollar and they're worth bagels. This is not that. Here you had a set of deposits and if the deposits just would have stayed, everything would have turned out fine. Is that right? And the bank would have made money. And, and what we had here is a bank run. Let's let's jump ahead to the Goldman Sachs defense. Let's skip slide five. All right. Let's skip the FDIC claims. Who are the auditors? All right. The Goldman Sachs defense. This, this goes to an argument that there was a unique causation to the decline that is not legally actionable either against the bank or Goldman Sachs or any of the officers or directors, because here what we saw is something that nobody anticipated, nobody wanted to create, and it was just different. It was a huge mistake in hindsight, but that's not the test under law. So the argument here would be that Goldman Sachs came up with a plan to raise capital to cover the mark-to-market losses. And it was the way this plan was announced and its structure that proximately caused the bank run and the collapse, all right? The maturity mismatches, that was all publicly disclosed. The VC concentrations, everybody knew about it. The deposits exceeding 250,000, 93% of it. Everybody knew about that. They knew about that for months and that could not have been the proximate cause of the collapse, never. Goldman obviously did not anticipate that their capital raise announcement would cause a run. It's not in their interests to kill their client. And if they did something to kill the client, it would be against Goldman's own interests itself. 
So if you look at motivation, if you look at intent, if you look at scienter, it's exactly the opposite. None of us wanted this to happen. And who has more expertise in capital raising than Goldman Sachs? And Silicon Valley Bank can argue, hey, we reasonably relied on Goldman's expertise. Quote from the Wall Street Journal, while few could have predicted the bank's violent reaction to the SVB disclosures, I mean, the market's violent reaction, Goldman's plan for the bank had a fatal flaw. But Goldman didn't know that it's, it, it, you don't go ahead with a fatal flawed plan if you know that it's fatally flawed. Goldman underestimated the danger that deluge of bad news could spark a crisis of confidence, a development that can quickly fell a bank. There you go. The way they announced the capital raise caused the outflow of the deposits, and it's the outflow of the deposits that caused the mismatch to become fatal, when in reality, if the money simply would have stayed there, you would have been fine. Next slide. And from this perspective, what we have is an unforeseen bank run that was inadvertently caused by the capital raise, and neither Silicon Valley Bank or Goldman, the argument will be, can or should be held liable for an event that was unforeseen and unprecedented. There's no scienter here, there's no recklessness here, there's no negligence, much less gross negligence. Is it a mistake? Yes. Is it a huge mistake? Oh boy, this is a big mistake. But it wasn't foreseeable and therefore arguably not legally actionable. That's clearly a defense that's going to be made as, as part of the story here. And I, I just wonder, Bobby, Colleen, what's your reaction? Colleen, do you want to go first? Nope. So, well, I would say that it's, you know, um, of course, none of the, the run wouldn't have happened if they had uh, managed to interest rate risk better, right? If, if, if they didn't have uh, these mark to market losses on their available for sale portfolio, um, if uh, the interest rate risk wasn't so plainly in sight, um, then you wouldn't have had to worry about this. So I think that, well, it's, it's, it's uh, having just said this, that, you know, that the, everything would have been actually fine for the bank if people had just stayed put. Um, that wasn't a realistic expectation, I think, um, and that was in fact a risk that should have been uh, considered when when they were deciding on how they were gonna um, invest this enormous uh, influx of deposits that received over uh, 2021. Um, there was a decision to invest in short duration uh, bonds uh, for precisely the liquidity risk. Um, they chose not to do so. Uh, I think I think that's the that's the problem they're gonna they're gonna confront. And there's also a much more complicated story that we won't have time to get into about hedging transactions and hedging hedges that were taken off. Uh, and we could do a whole hour just on the hedge transactions, the accounting for the hedge transactions, how and why the hedges were put on, how and why they were taken off. And I know Colleen goes, oh, my God, please let me do another hour. on it. <laughs> would be I was it's hoping you would ask, Joe. No, because it's a fascinating story about the interaction yeah. of accounting and economics and prudential banking and the like. So, when it, how it, how it so I, I'm going to exercise my uh, moderator prerogative here because there have been some questions on on the on on this distinction between held to maturity and available for sale, um, and maybe Colleen. So, and, and there's been some some great questions that hopefully we can, we can get to. So maybe Colleen, do you want to briefly just give an overview of this distinction between held to maturity and available for sale securities and and how this kind of blew a hole in the capital uh, of at least the perceived capital of, of SVB? Yeah, definitely. One thing I would also just very quickly mention on the hedging is, um, well, we'll discuss this, but the held to maturity securities are commonly, you. if you do, um, accounting treatment will not, accounting will not give you sort of beneficial accounting treatment if you want to hedge those hedge to uh, held to maturity securities, because it's thought to be inconsistent with the intent of those securities because if you're holding them to maturity, you shouldn't really be worried about interest rate risk. So one quick comment on the um, hedging, but now if we get into sort of the big picture of debt securities. So if Kristen, if this one's a flow chart, this is actually a slide that I use in class and I promise you guys, I will not discuss too much about accounting, but also as Kristen mentioned, I do have a PhD in bookkeeping uh, as my mom calls it. So I love this stuff. 
And I find it's easiest if we think about debt securities in more of a flowchart approach. So there are three classifications that we're going to discuss. And we go through and figure out how to classify a security based on our answers to a couple of questions. So the first is, does management intend to sell the securities in the near term? And if the answer to that is yes, well, we put them in a bucket, we call that trading securities. Now, if the answer to this is no, then we go on to the next part of our flowchart. And we ask, does management have the intent and ability to hold the security until its maturity? And if the answer to that is yes, well, then we put that as held to maturity. If no, we put it as available for sale. And the reason that this matters, if we go to the next slide, is that the classification that we put as security determines how we actually carry it on the balance sheet. So I saw an excellent question in the chat about why don't we put held to maturity securities um, at fair value on the balance sheet? And why do we have them at this you know, cost, um, amortized cost basis? And the idea is, well, if we, we only put them as a held to maturity security, if we intend to hold it to maturity and we have the ability to do so. And so if we think about it from that perspective, accounting takes the view that, look, fair value doesn't matter because we're going to hold it to maturity anyway. Um, whereas your available for sale ones, we put those uh, the fair value on the balance sheet. Now, I don't have trading on here because Silicon Valley Bank didn't have trading securities. Now, for the unrealized gains and losses, so when these securities fluctuate, for held to maturity, we don't recognize those unrealized gains or losses. Um, for available for sale, we do, but we recognize them only in the statement of other comprehensive income. And as I tell my students in class, like the statement of other comprehensive income, it exists, but it is a distant cousin relative to our actual income statement. And you know, not as many people look at it as perhaps we would like. Um, with that said, I think if we look at the, go to the next slide. If we look at the actual balance sheet here, so I think one issue that Joe had wanted to discuss is like, well, to what extent was there full disclosure? And here, I think we want to start by looking just at the balance sheet. And we can see from the balance sheet, you know, the available for sale securities were about 12% of total assets are held to maturity were 43%. So these are very big as a percentage of our total assets. Now, as I mentioned, your held to maturity securities, these are gonna be recorded at amortized cost on our balance sheet. But, and I think Kristen, if you click here, um, our held to maturity, we have the fair value and we report the fair value of those securities. Uh, sorry, I guess not. Um, actually in the balance sheet itself. So when you're reading through the balance sheet, you, know, you have your amortized costs here for those held to maturity, but then we have our fair value right here. So we can look at that and we can see the decline in fair value over 2022. And we can see that it declined from about 97.2 billion down to 76.2 billion, um, even though they were still being recorded at about 91.3 billion. And again, the idea is just, well, those fluctuations we don't think matter because, at least from an accounting perspective, because we do intend to hold them to maturity. Whereas for available for sale, or if we had trading, those would be put out as fair value here. Um, with that said, and I think next, if we go to the next slide, it's really interesting if we look at this long-term. And if we look at the difference between that book value as opposed to our actual fair value and just compare it. And we can see the difference we start to see this kind of growing difference back in 2021 in the second half. And then it just continues through 2022 peaks in about Q3 2022. And just to give you some context for the magnitude here of the difference between, you know, our carrying value, the book value at amortized cost, as opposed to the fair value, we're talking about over 16 billion. And compared to the total equity, you know, our total, total book equity there, is about 15.8 billion. So this is a really significant number that you know, for somebody who's reading and drilling into the financial statements, you would be able to discern. And so Bobby, I don't know if that answers your question or if we want to do Q&A or go through the rest of the slides. You know, you know, just, just a quick observation looking at this. All of this was publicly available, right? Yeah. So everybody knew about the maturity mismatch. And 
the money was still staying at the bank, right? And the money was, was coming in. And all of the depositors and everybody else could actually see, hey, we got a maturity mismatch and we're putting more money in the bank. So clearly defendants are going to be able to argue that the market didn't see an issue with that, all right? Uh, you know, at least until we, we, we had the unwind because of the capital uh, raise. And I think a similar, you know, fact in favor of that interpretation of uh, history is, uh, I think the next slide that, that Colleen has here, uh, which Colleen, I think this, yeah. Um, did, did you want to describe this, what you have? Um, I'm happy to, or if Joe wants to take this one, but I think the short interest is very, very interesting here. Yeah. So, so just, you know, very briefly, one of the things that you look at when you analyze these types of cases, you say, well, how many people actually looked at this stuff and said, I, I think I smell a rat here. All right. I think I see a problem and the market doesn't yet see that problem. And there are multiple ways of looking at that. You know, you look at uh, press reports, you look at analyst reports, uh, you look at the stuff that short sellers are putting out, and you also look at the volume of the short interest. Uh, and here, the thing that's really remarkable is uh, the tremendous extent to which, uh, particularly in the second half of 2022, short interest in Silicon Valley bank shares really spiked uh, in a way that was quite unusual relative to the comparables. So that would suggest that there was a significant community of investors who are highly sophisticated, who are able to look at the publicly available information and say, you know, we see a problem here. Uh, and this is one metric of that. And that would be consistent with the observation that the bad news was in the market and many people were understanding it. And there was a heterogeneous set of expectations surrounding that publicly available information. And I, I don't know if we have the slide, but the, the relationship between that spike in 2022 uh, between short interest and um, long-term treasuries is um, is almost a uh, elasticity of, of one. Um, it's a, in that it was almost perfectly tracking the increase in, in long-term rates. And so clearly this was a negative sentiment about SVB's interest rate exposure. It's exactly right. I mean, you know, if you ran a regression here, you'd probably be able to say, hey, this is this is just a bet on the maturity mismatch becoming a problem for the bank. So let's go to QA. Yeah. Yeah. So um so so a couple of questions came in on on a topic actually that um we, we passed over uh to, to get to the uh accounting issues, but it involves this 10b5. Uh, one plan um, by the ex executives of SVB and in, in the, the 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 selling um, just before the demise of of the bank um, by uh, uh, Mr. Becker and others. Um, Joe, Joe, did you want to revisit this this topic, which I know you didn't have a chance to get to earlier? Sure. Let's scroll back, Kristen. If you could find the slide that goes to the potential defense. No, straight ahead. No, let's let's go. Right. I think this was the this was the one that I I yeah. So basically, ten b five one plans they're either very complicated or they're very simple. Let's do it simple. If you put the plan in place, and if it doesn't have certain frills and other features that aren't pr present here, and if at the time you put the plan in place you are not in possession of material non-public information, then you're going to be fine. Even if at some point in the future a sale takes place when otherwise it would have been impermissible because you then would have had material non-public information. In other words, it's a way of freezing time and saying my state of mind is frozen as of the time of inception and you can't attribute any future learned information to the decision to actually sell the shares. All right, so what's the claim gonna be with regard to Becker? Well, you put the, place, the, the plan in place on January 26th. Right away, the question is going to be, Mr. Becker, what did you know and when did you know it? At the time that you put this plan in place, were you in possession of material non-public information? Now, the answer to that question is going to map perfectly onto the price inflation claims that the plaintiffs are going to make. They're going to say that the price of the stock was inflated because 
you didn't disclose the issues you were having with the Federal Reserve. You didn't disclose all the problems you had with your risk model, yada, 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 yada. All of the stuff that you say you didn't disclose that's different from what Colleen just walked through, which was really big, really important, but you did disclose. So the question is simply going to be, is that delta in information, the difference between what was disclosed and what was not disclosed, is that material? And from that perspective, these are really two different ways of looking at the implications of the same constellation of underlying facts. Then pursuant to the plan on February 27th, all right, about a month later, he sells 3.6 million of Silicon Valley Bank shares. Then approximately 10 days later, the bank announces the 1.8 billion loss on the sale of 21 billion and the plans to raise the 2.25 billion. This is where it blows up. This is where the argument's going to be. This was a terrible mistake, but it wasn't fraud and it wasn't mismanagement. Nobody saw this coming. This was an unprecedented bank run. $42 billion escapes from the bank in, in, in one day, and the bank is shut down. Kristen, can we scroll ahead to the speed, the slide that I had about the speed of, of the bank run here, which is really unprecedented in banking history? There you go. Potential Twitter defense. Back one more. Here you go. So you had $42 billion, all right, in 10 hours. That's $4.2 billion an hour or more than a million dollars per second for 10 hours straight. That's the math. Quote, to put that in context, the previous largest bank run in modern U.S. history was at WAMU 2008, $16.7 billion over 10 days. Totally non-comparable. If, if you say, well, all right, what's the biggest one bank run that we have in history? WAMU, 16.7 over 10 days. Well, that'll give us time to respond if we have the same thing happening here at Silicon Valley Bank. Instead, you get a fire hose of money leaving at an unprecedented rate. Nobody has ever seen $42 billion leave All right, in that period of time. And especially when you take that as a percentage of the total asset base, obvious. No bank can withstand that kind of outflow in a single day, especially when a similar sized outflow was all but certain the following day. So if you would have had the worst case bank run based on historical precedent, maybe you could have managed that. But there was no historical precedent for what we actually saw. Potentially exacerbating the fact was that lead venture capitalists were publicly urging depositors to flee, arguably exacerbating the run. Ezra Klein has a terrific piece in New York Times. I love all of Klein, almost all of Klein's stuff. It was very good work. Um, and what he said is basically, look, this is the first bank run that was broadcast. It was immediately, it was amplified through social media. And in many ways, I would describe it as more than a traditional capital flight. It was social media fright. This goes back to a legally important question, how much of this was foreseeable? And given the fact that there is no historical precedent and we are orders of magnitude from where we were before, you can see defendants arguing, we didn't see this coming and we couldn't reasonably have foreseen it coming. What do you think? Uh Bank runs in the Twitter era, I guess, is what, what we were now saying. Um, so, uh, so I. By the way, I know I know they're at one p.m. I think we're we're at our our stopping point here. Um, um, but I, uh, Kristen, is that is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah. Sorry, we are at one o'clock. So I, I apologize uh, to the, the uh, folks who asked um, some great questions we didn't get a, a chance to. I know we covered some of them throughout the, the process, but we didn't uh, get to address um, all of them. Um, so um, feel free to reach out to us if, if uh, you, you have remaining questions you'd, you'd like us to uh, try to address. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, thanks to everyone for uh, joining us. Um, Joe, Colleen, I don't know if you have any sort of concluding remarks. 
just a couple of questions, just you know, housekeeping. So, so Chris, it, it, will we be making our slide deck available to the participants? If you are okay with that, yes, we can share it with all of the registrants. We're fine. Could you tell people how they might be able to get a copy of the deck if they are so inclined? We'll circulate that to everyone who is registered and we'll let you all know when the recording is available. Excellent. And Great. I'd like to thank my colleagues, you know, uh, you guys were terrific, Kristen, you know, especially you were great. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the valuable time out of your day. And as I hope we, we emphasized, there's going to be a lot of litigation here and there's going to be a lot of new law being made. And we have to pay attention as much, I think, to where the law is headed as where the law has been. Um, there's going to be new stuff coming here and it'll be fascinating. Great. Thank you, Joe, Colleen, and Bobby for delving into a topic that is complex and very fast and moving. Thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.